Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, wherever you may be. We have been roll calling, you know, the places that you've, uh, you're coming from. Welcome to the second day of um, Open Ed Conference. Can you believe that? Um, did you all sleep well? <laughs> I hope so, and I hope you had a good first day yesterday. Um, we really had lots of fun, um, you know, bringing this conference for you. Uh, before I start with um, introducing our speakers for today, I'd like to just um, remind you to check out our welcome desk and virtual lounge via Zoom. So you'll find lots of resources there to help you navigate our, um, the conference and also meet new folks. And also, um, if you have not checked out Discord, please do so. There's a lot of really um, fun, interesting conversations, lots of pet pictures <laughs> being shared and food pictures being shared. And you know, you'll meet a lot of um, you know, folks in the open community in there too. And of course, um, if you have not checked out conversations in Twitter, our hashtag is um, OpenEd20. Check it out too. There's really a lot of um, amazing conversations in there. So I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for today. And just a little background on how this journey came about. So when we were brainstorming, I don't know, back in the summer um, of who might be our possible plenary speakers, Mia and Maha were the first person that came to my mind. Yes, yes, because I really want to amplify their message and provide inspiration for all of us as we reimagine open education and even higher education writ large. And so when I, when I invited um, them, you know, sent them an email and they said, yes, I, were like, I was like so ecstatic and I was so happy. And, and I really think that their work with Equity and Bound um, socially just academia and the many other projects that you will hear um, from them as they do their presentation underscores the need and the imperative for us to build online communities that are rooted in care, compassion, concern, kindness, and equity, and with social justice as, as its core. And so we are in for a treat today and what a good way to start the second day of our Open Ed Conference. Folks, let's give a warm, warm welcome to Mia Samora and Maha Bali. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. Assalamu alaikum, which works for morning, night, hi, bye. <laughs> um, I'm Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo. And I'm Mia Zamora from Kane University, which is right outside of New, uh, New York City. And we are so thrilled to share with you today Equitable Emergence, telling the story of equity unbound in the open. Which we co-facilitate together. And these slides are bit.ly slash Miaha. We have a couple names. <laughs> Miaha, that's the, the blend. <laughs> so before we get started, tell us how you're feeling today. If your day started earlier like mine, take a stretch, take a sip of water, get ready for a, an interactive keynote. Um, how are you feeling today? Optimistic, chat, excited, me. grateful. These are really beautiful. Inspired, excellent. Low energy, so you guys woke me up. Yes. That's good. <laughs> Jazzed, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Feeling thankful to be here and hear from everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Motivated, energized, inspired from yesterday. Yes, yesterday was awesome. I was in a few sessions and I was really happy to be there. I see some stressed, 
And, and that is something I think we can all understand. And Skipping it's breakfast. an ongoing thing. <laughs> that, that kind of contributes to the stress. We try to, yeah, hungry. Yeah, start, get something to eat. Yeah, get snacks. I, I would show you the table around me and how many snacks I have over here. <laughs> Overextended, I know that's- I have curiously strong mints. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dance while buried in paperwork. Curious, Confident, I love that. Making Hopeful. breakfast while listening, that's good to do. Wonderful. Ready. <laughs> Open-minded, I like that one. Mm. That's a state of feeling. Gratitude. All right, expectant. Oh, now there's pressure. And Danielle Leek, this is your double yay because you put us in a good mood with this tweet that you <laughs> sent out this just today, like a few minutes ago. So thank you for that. Go ahead, Mia. Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost the screen. Hold just a minute. Oh, so we're talking about the journey for today. Oh, so the journey for today is just as the image appears, it's winding, it's, um, you know, there's no clear pathway. Um, there's some ominous images, like ominous sky in the background that sort of, you know, there's some foreboding in the background, but there's also sunlight coming through. And we thought this was the perfect image to um, describe our journey today. And uh, it's our journey with Equity Unbound, but also our journey today is we're gonna be moving between topics and also hoping to have you contribute. And we're gonna give you some uh, choices over which way we go with this keynote. Um, so the first thing we want to ask you in the chat is what does equity mean to you? And we'll wait and read out some of the things that you say. Dead. Wow. Level playing field. Dismantling, Dismantling oppressive, oppressive systems. systems. Justice, fair access, need-based. That's an interesting one. Representative access, and available. Access and opportunity, justice, considering others. Accessibility. Are you at a different speed than I am? <laughs> no, I just, I'm just throwing out ones that catch my <laughs> eye. They're, they're coming in so quickly. Yeah, they Everyone are. gets what they need to thrive. Struggling with it, everyone gets a shot. Level playing field suggests competition and winning. I like that. That's a good point. Distribution based on need. Meeting people where they are. Opportunity um, to all. Listening. Centrality. Reconciliation and decolonization. Hi, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Dismantled power structures. Minority access, inclusivity, differentiated supports for all. Okay, let's move to the next question, Mia. The next question we wanna ask you is, what does unbound mean to you? Well, someone said liberation about equity and that's good. People are here saying freedom. Limitless, <laughs> barrier free. Across borders. Uncensored. Free, <laughs> with a lot of ease. <laughs> no paywalls. Lowering Without restriction, mind. yeah. No chains, I like no chains. Emancipated. Chaos. No <laughs> gatekeeping. It's very interesting, the ones that we choose to say at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're also just like catching them as they fly through, right? <laughs> Fearless. Unstoppable, able to soar, empowerment. Okay, so, so this image is probably one that some of you had in mind when you said equity versus equality, and you've probably seen one similar to it, but I like this particular one. Um, I'm not going to pause too much because I know people are familiar with this kind of thing by now. One mm -hmm. of the things I say is obviously there's this equity piece where you give people different supports to reach the same goal. Um, but sometimes not everyone wants an apple. And so why are we assuming that the goal is unified and everyone wants the same goal and we're just about giving them different supports to reach the same goal? What if someone wants an orange? And we know that oranges don't grow on apple trees. So it's a lot more complex than that. But not only that, there are also some invisible inequalities. Like someone may, maybe they don't need an apple, but they need care. They look like they're privileged and they have everything they need, but it's intersectional, right? It doesn't stop there. So um, the question was uh, thrown out to Twitter. What is equity without care? And what is care without equity? 
Now feel free to type your responses now. It's my pinned tweet, so if you want to reply on Twitter, that's okay too. Um, we were we received some interesting feedback um, when Maha uh, threw out this tweet just recently. Uh, Kate Denial says, "Care without equity." is a fundamentally unjust practice that tries to place a Band-Aid over a deep rupture and pretend the injury is taken care of. Equity without care can be harmful. It privileges a goal over the humanity of those engaged in reaching that goal. And so that Band-Aid is maybe not even the best thing you can offer someone. It's a temporary thing, right? Catherine Cronin wrote that care without equity is care for a few because it can potentially exacerbate inequality. And Sarah Lambert was saying that equity without care in organizations can become diversity theater. So it's a performance or a show, but it's not true equity. Mm -hmm. Kate Bowles yeah, well, suggested that both care and equity are design choices made by those with the power to choose how others will be treated neither fully challenge the power that gets to choose. And so what Kate said uh, made me think of Nancy Fraser's uh, model of social justice, where for her, the epitome was parity of participation, where everyone gets to participate in this power of decision-making of how things will go. And I love this quote from Desmond Tutu that uh, Tutalini Asino taught me, which mm -hmm. is, he's saying, I don't wanna pick up the crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want the full menu of rights. And a lot of people mm -hmm. in my part of the world, this will resonate with you, right? Uh, but I would argue not even just wanting the full menu of rights to be given to us. I think we need to be able to have the agency to create our own menu and choose our own ingredients. And that would be more socially just rather than have someone else decide what our goals are and what equity means for us. And so Sukaina Walji is also, this terminology also comes from Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams' work that builds on Nancy Fraser's work, which is saying care is ameliorative. So it's going to be the responsibility of maybe an individual and experienced by an individual, kind of like also what K Catherine was saying. Whereas equity is transformative and has systemic impacts. And so while Mia and I were brainstorming, this is maybe two days ago that we came up with this <laughs> model that we're really proud of, <laughs> but it's a work in progress. It's a work in um, progress. <laughs> <laughs> we put care and equity on a spectrum and put them on two axes. Um, and so we thought Tanya Elias uh, was saying that equity without care is structural so that it can't be undone by someone being careless. And that's a little bit like what Sukaina was saying. And Donna Lanklo was saying something quite similar, that you want institutions to put equity as a structure in place. She doesn't want empathy from her institution. She wants justice and people should be able to get treated well and with dignity, regardless of who cares about them or who doesn't. Um, Parisa Mehran and Sarah Lambert were more skeptical about this quadrant. And they said, is it tokenism? Is it diversity mm -hmm. theater if you do equity without care? So now we want you guys to look at the right bottom quadrant where care and inequity converge. And Autumn Kane said something so, so articulate. Care is a coping mechanism that arises in environments without equity. It's the scramble that we all know in our hearts. Um, and I think there's one more, Maha, press one more time. There's one more quote. Um, it was our dear Catherine, co-founder of Equity Unbound, who said that care without equity is care for a few, the few who are seen. This means less or no care for those who are less visible, already marginalized. Care without equity writ large exacerbates inequality. So what is the result in this quadrant of care without, uh, without equity? It ends up being an, a selective kind of lens on who needs the care. And ultimately it exhausts us all. It's about effective labor. It's about being so drained because our hearts and our energy is put towards fixing what the system hasn't addressed. Yeah. And those are things that also Martin Muller and Tim Fon said in their response to this. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you have equity with care, we hope this comes close to justice. And this it feels kind of, I, I'm, I'm worried about saying this, but I think the virtually connecting model of intentionally equitable hospitality attempts to put a process in place that is a systemic kind of equity, but also to make sure that the people involved who are enacting this have this sort of equity embodied and they, they do the care in the everyday work. Uh, but of course, none of this is perfect, even if it's your goal to do it. It's aspirational, but it's, it's something ongoing. 
Um, but of course, this dark corner on the left bottom quadrant is where no care and inequity converge. And that obviously is systemic injustice. And unfortunately, I think our hearts have been broken over and over again. And we know what that looks like. Yeah. And of course, during COVID, this was happening in spades, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is maybe a simpler image to look at. We just wanted to recognize some of the tweets that helped inspire our thinking. And this is, uh, you know, this is just a work in progress. We've only had two days to think about it. And even already, I'm starting to think of <laughs> other things to include. So feedback is welcome. We've tweeted it out. Uh, if you're here, please get back in touch with us and tell us what you think we might be missing, uh, what we could add to it, and we'll develop it, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Right. We wish we could hear your reaction to this picture. <laughs> we found it by, we were looking for something and we found it and we liked it. So give your mind a break for a second. This is our Catch pause up. moment. And, yeah, <laughs> I'll just take a quick look at the chat. All the quoted people are women. I'm almost automatically now Honorary towards Desmond doing teacher. that. There is Martin Weller, and but <laughs> and, he's, but he's yes, from Tim South Fon. Africa, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's Tim Fons and Martin Weller yes. in small font. Very small font. <laughs> They're kind of, <laughs> but yes, I actually intentionally do this, and now it's natural. I don't, I don't do it on purpose anymore. It, it was intentional, and now it's intuitive. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's become systemic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so I've already talked about intentionally equitable hospitality. Folks want to read the paper by the co-directors of Virtually Connecting, or if you've experienced Virtually Connecting, you probably understand what we're trying to do, which doesn't always work, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but other ways. Do, how do we achieve equity with care, um, with care? And one of the things that we know is important is centering empathy and care in a time of trauma. And we've even positioned care as an act of resistance. We've set out to ask the simple question: Can care be an explicit tool of social transformation? And uh, we've discovered along the way that centering empathy also means the importance of making ourselves vulnerable. So um, the founders of Equity Unbound, along with Parisa Meran, who's a very important partner in our work, um, we've written about this and um, that will be something that will be distributed after it's published soon. Yeah. And so it's just always important to remember the different layers of applying equity and social justice work. So there's, of course, in the situation or embodied in context, like when you're with your students in the room and something happens and how you respond to that. And of course, if you have a curriculum that's designed, for example, to be uh, flexible or to be agentic or to center social justice, it becomes easier to react in that context, mm -hmm. building on what you've already got as a foundation. But there are also higher levels. Yeah, um, advocacy at the institutional level is, is, is a real profound step in this kind of hierarchy of layers of social justice work. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a very quick anecdote from my own experience. As the mass, uh, director of a master's in writing studies program, my graduate assistants came to me several years ago and indicated that the GRE exam was a hardship for applicants that they know are worthy and wonderful people. And then they mentioned that the this exam was above $200, which in, I was ignorant of. And as soon as I heard that, I eliminated the GRE from our requirements for our application portfolio because I thought it was so important to, to, to live this um, process of equity. So that's an example of how one can do that in an institutional context. But I think the sort of final horizon of an empowered sense of equity is uh, the work that can be done um, as public intellectuals. And and producing public scholarship. Um, and so that's the level that we're imagining is unbound. Laura Turnovich is saying, say more about advocacy and institutional work. And I would say, actually, Laura, you can tell us. Why don't you yeah. tell us about what you do in your own institution? I would say in my own institution, some of the things, the kinds of advocacy I was doing, especially during COVID. Um, so one of the things with me is that my public scholarship has always been more unbound than my institutional advocacy, but I still kept trying to do my values thing. But like when COVID happened, I was talking all the time about centering care, about advocating for the grades, you know, the pass fail thing, advocating for no, for no proctoring and trying to make sure that everything, every space where I had a voice to make a difference, I would talk to the right people and influence them before decisions were made as much as possible. 
um, and also like encouraging them to listen to the student voice, empowering my own students so that they can rise up and, and protest, you know, because sometimes you want it to come from the students, but they need help in how they write their message and to get all the information they need. Um, somebody needs the link to the slides. It's bit.ly bit slash miaha. M I A. So, <laughs> <laughs> so unbound by institutional structures, by institutional timelines, by institutional or academic standards of what is allowed, what counts as knowledge, and what priorities are, by whom to share with. And so we sort of just want you to think this is maybe a difficult one to write in the chat right away. Feel free to write, of course, but think about how does your open practice connect with unboundedness? In what ways might your institution be restricting you and your open practice be an outlet sort of for your values? We asked, <clears throat> we asked on Twitter, what does equity unbound mean to you? Some people responded around the concept, others responded around the network and the community. Um, which was very interesting to us. I asked Jim Stauffer to clarify if he was coming in just in terms of the concept or in terms of the experience of the network. And he said that he found his way to the network through one particular um, experience, which is the 1HE Global uh, resources that we developed for um, online community building. Uh, next slide, Maha. Can you advance? Yeah. So basically, I, I thanked Jim for clarifying that he uh, found his way in in one way, but was thinking about the concept more broadly in his tweet. But I also pointed out that there are several doors in which you can find your way to the work of Equity, and equity Unbound. And so there, there was this conversation I was having with Mia when my daughter drew this doodle on one of her Arabic textbooks. And I was telling her, is this the same character? She's like, yeah, it's a story. And I said, do you read it from right to left, like in Arabic, or do you read it from left to right? And some of you may have seen my blog post because she said, you can read it either way. If it's from left to right, this is the story. If it's from right to left, this is the story. And I was talking to me about this concept of a bilingual story that reads both ways. And it made me think of the notion of crystallization. If you're not familiar with this notion, it comes from Laurel Richardson. It's a transgressive perspective on research validity. It's sort of against triangulation where you're trying to get all the angles to give you the same answer. It's actually the other way around. It's like looking at human and social interactions from multiple lenses and that there are divergent possibilities because people can be looking at something like Equity Unbound from different perspectives coming in from different doorways and perceiving it in different ways. Also the equity care uh, concept, uh, people have had very different perspectives on which would be. So it's totally all right to have these complex and partial understandings. Exactly, Jess, bi-directional stories through crystallization perspectives. Um, we also wanted to share with you um, the, the value and the disposition of emergence as a really important underpinning for us. We are a knowledge community that leaves room for unknown and unforeseen learning outcomes. The learning of participants depends on being a co-evolving part of a dynamic whole. So as facilitators, we're striving to catalyze growth and to facilitate bottom-up knowledge production. Um, this next thing is something that I think is helpful to sort of understand the growth of Equity Unbound over time. We're gonna show you something called eco-cycle planning. And those of you who are gonna follow references, this full reference is there and the links are there. <laughs> it's, it comes from complexity science and agriculture and it's a little bit of a complex diagram. I'm gonna to try to sort of explain it. Let me see if I can use an um, annotation from Zoom to sort of make it easier to show what I'm saying. Yeah, I think this helps. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first thing is to think that when you've been doing something for a long time, whether in your work or in the context of something like Equity Unbound, we're still going to describe what it is in a minute. Um, but there are things you've been doing for a while and they just keep going on their own. They don't need new resources. You just need to manage them. And these are mat at maturity. It's like harvesting, right? But sometimes something changes in your context and, you know, it's no longer achieving what you need. Maybe it's falling into a rigidity trap. You're just doing it because you've always been doing it. Uh, think about parenting, like your child grows and they no longer enjoy playing basketball and you still think they do and you keep doing it and they're not enjoying it anymore. You need to notice that and you need to say, we're going to creatively destroy this and go into renewal and start a new idea. And that new idea is in gestation. 
It's just in, in your mind, it hasn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. And unless you give it resources, you'll fall into the poverty trap. So what you want to know is what great new ideas do you have that will help you meet your purpose? And what kind of resources do you need to give it so that it comes to birth and it can then grow into maturity eventually? So sometimes in order to, to give birth to these gestational ideas, you need to decide to destroy some stuff. And it requires a different kind of person or a different dimension of you as a leader. Mm -hmm. Are you more of a manager who maintains what's already there? Are you a kind of a heretic, if you're comfortable with, the, with this word, um, who's willing to, to destroy something that everyone's been used to doing for so long and they can't imagine letting go of? Or are you a network weaver who's always got new ideas uh, you know, all over the place? Or are you someone who's really good at tending? You're an entrepreneur and you're good at starting new things, right? Yeah, parenting goes through this cycle every few months, yes. especially when they're very young. Yes. yes. Iterative, always iterative. <laughs> right. So I love this model. And if you want to see a video of us going through it with um, our community building resources and deciding what to go next, you can watch this video later by Nancy White, who's a wonderful person. Um, and so in your own context, um, what kind of practices, just think about this, did you have to creatively destroy during COVID? What about ideas that are in gestation that you need to nurture with resources for them to be born and to grow? Where are you gonna get these resources? You know, you've had a good idea for two months and you haven't started it yet. And then where are your strengths as a leader? Are you better at being a manager, entrepreneur, network weaver, heretic? Is that why you might not be enjoying what you're doing sometimes? Mm -hmm. Go Mia. So at this point, we want to formally introduce you to the open network and community that's known as Equity Unbound. Equity Unbound aims to create equity-focused, open, connected, intercultural learning experiences across classes, across uh, countries, across contexts. The original founders, Maha, Catherine, Catherine Cronin, and myself, um, imagined a network of learners and educators that would collaborate across literal and figurative boundaries. Next slide. <laughs> so there are, for you. <laughs> four, yeah, there are four prongs of our equity and bound work that can be apprehended. And so we have the first prong here. Um, it's represented by this pink box and it's our open and connected curriculum. So this is for learners and educators everywhere um, at all levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, post uh, professional development, all those who are interested in exploring digital literacies with an equity and intercultural learning focus. Um, so this curriculum is ever evolving and it's crowdsourced by the community and it's a series of activities, learning resources, events that support co-teaching, co-learning and collaboration. So COVID-19 hit. The next prong of our work is represented by the blue box and it's commonly known as continuity, our continuity with care work. So again, this was born um, of that abrupt moment of crisis known to us all as the pivot, the dreaded pivot, when much of the world realized that education would have to continue in an online environment. We crowdsourced a list of resources um, to assist in online teaching, um, including specifically care strategies and care tips. We also held open forums to develop and extend care and support the open community. It was a place that nurtured us during a really hard time. Um, moving on to the uh, third prong of Equity Unbound, uh, which is represented here by the purple box. It's commonly known as socially uh, just or imagining socially just academia. Um, so on the heels of the horrible, horror-filled uh, horror murders of Ahmed Aubrey, uh, George Floyd, and so many others, we doubled down in supporting Black Lives Matter, um, shut down academia and more specifically our commitment to social justice. Um, so we're asking, uh, oh, we organized uh, in the summer of 2020 um, a, an event that was uh, called Inclusive Citation. Um, but we're asking the question, in what ways does the status quo of the academy 
contribute to systemic racism? And how can we start to address this problem? So since then, we have continued to organize a series of workshops, conversations around these issues. So finally, the green box, uh, the last prong of our identifiable work is the wonderful partnership between Equity Unbound and 1HE Global, um, whose mission is to build a global community of educators focused on better teaching. So with so many of these COVID-19 challenges still looming large for the education sector, um, we have developed some open educational resources for online community building. And these are open, accessible activities and pedagogical strategies for teachers everywhere, whether they are in higher ed or in the K through 12 context. And none of these were me and myself alone. We have always had collaborators. So with the Equity Unbound curriculum, our co-founder was Catherine Cronin. Whoops, something weird just happened. Whoop. What happened? Hang on, hang on. Okay. This has to happen, right? These things always happen. Ah, <laughs> must have clicked something. Okay. Woo! Hang it's on a flying second. Around, but it, it will come back. <laughs> there we go. Okay. One. Mm -hmm. All right. Two. All right. Good. <laughs> we saw too much. Pretend you didn't see that. The reveal. <laughs> we were um, supported uh, with from Mozilla Open Leaders with a mentor who is Sam, Sam Ahern, but the entire community really. Um, and you know there were others as well involved in Equity and Bound at various points, and some of them are here in a, in one of our meetings together. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the continuity with care. We had a crowdsourcing projects and we had uh, several sessions, sometimes with educators, sometimes educators and students. But there was also a Twitter DM that is, we'll talk about later, maybe. <laughs> and then with Socially Just Academia, again, we're a large group. It was inspired by a conversation I had with Kim Fox, who's with us uh, here. And we have uh, several collaborators, not all of them are in the picture, but Jasmine Roberts, who is one of the conference organizers, and Tutalene Asino, who has organized uh, open ed conferences, co-organized open ed conferences before, and others whose names we'll mention later. Um, and then with the community building resources, Autumn Keynes was a key co-curator with me and myself. Uh, we use the virtually connecting YouTube account um, and just generally virtually connecting resources and 1HE and our key collaborator there was Nikki Spalding. Um, and so here's the time for the poll. I think I can just run the poll, right? I'm going to run this poll and we want to ask you which one of these do you want to hear about first? You can vote for more than one um, and then we're just going to pick the ones that you prioritize and talk about them first. We have slides on each of them, but we'll go through slower the ones that you guys are most interested in hearing about. So someone Ooh. closed the poll. I didn't close it, but someone closed it. Is that normal? Something weird just happened. It started again. OK, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I didn't really Sorry, it was my fault. Okay. Uh, OK, don't, I'm you not don't touching have to anything. <laughs> no, no, pretend it was Zoom's fault. You're doing a lot. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, Zoom. Okay. I thought maybe Zoom can't handle 300 people, 300 plus people. It's almost. Oh, it's actually quite a different people. vote now. That yeah. um... look at that. It's like it's a race. You want to know the popular vote or the? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. Other people can't see the poll until I end the poll and share it, right? So I, it looks like people have stopped voting at 73%, which is quite a lot of people. Um, and I'm gonna end the poll because people have just really stopped. All right, let's see if it I can It looks share. like we're gonna start with Socially Just Academia. Yeah, so you can see it. Okay, let me just share with everyone. So yeah, Socially Just Academia got 45%, um, and then the Equity Unbound Curriculum, and then Community Building Resources, and Continuity with Care would be the last one, all right? All right, I'm going to stop sharing results. So let's click socially just and Mia, you go with this one, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. All right. So you already mentioned the first event, so let's. Um... So yeah, first event happened. Uh, it was called Inclusive Citation, and it was just um, the the moment of all the frustration emerging so much um, and so vividly sort of prompt us to have that Inclusive Citation event. So uh, next slide, Maha. Did, okay. Um, so uh, 
what's amazing is this whole vast project started with the seed of care, basically. Maha reached out to her friend Kim Fox, who's here today um, at AUC, and said, how are you? Are you okay? And they got to talking and this uh, sort of vision of needing to do something as soon as possible sort of emerged from it. And so uh, my response to their interaction there was just to say so, so, so much has emerged. This is an example of our um, theory and value of emergence. When, you, when something grabs your heart, um, it, it gains a certain momentum and it can be something important. So uh, this is an open networked long-term project. It's a series of listening sessions, conversations and workshops aimed at dismantling oppression and promoting decolonial and anti-racist practices in academic institutions, research practice, curricula and teaching practices. Many of the people who have come, I think, um, are grounded in institutions where they're seeking a pathway for how to do this kind of work. So this is um, something that happens on a public and open scale and then is brought home locally. These are the wonderful facilitators of the project. Um, Tutino Asino, uh, Tutelani Asino, Mahabali, Leslie Chan, Jose Cosa, Kim Fox, Doris Jones, Manita Mulman, uh, Jasmine Roberts, and myself. Um, one of Jasmine's tweets um, really um, caught my attention and all of our attentions by saying, my little academic heart is full. Another example of the power of these conversations to give us strength as we move forward in a time when we need the network and the community in order to do the work that we seek as important. Uh, Tutelani um, was saying that asynchronicity, uh, asynchronicity can be an example of decolonizing time. We always struggle with this in Equity and Bound, this idea of when we're going to do work because people are all over the world and it's, you know, convenience. What's convenient for one is not convenient for another. So we had a great conversation about time and decolonizing time and it's it, with so many different um, implications involved. Mm -hmm. And we're still in the process of creating that asynchronous community for socially just academia beyond the conversations that we're having live to make sure that we have space to, to stay in touch and work together beyond those live events. Mm -hmm. um, so academia is centered on the idea of learning but we also forget about the need to unlearn. There are many things, uh, many habits when we are professionalized that we take on that ultimately sustain certain kinds of epistemic um, uh, inequity and injustice. And so this unlearning process is very much what we are trying to do uh, with this aspect of our uh, social, imagining a socially just academia. Uh, Jasmine says, in what ways, or I guess she was quoting, but she's saying, in what ways are our scholarly practices also activist? So we're thinking about that convergence and identity between scholarship and making the world a better place and taking action in that direction. And I love what Jasmine actually wrote right now in the chat, and I think it's worth quoting as well. Care is an action. Remember that when someone shares their story related to trauma, especially trauma related to the legacy of colonization, and you do nothing about it, that is an oppressive act. Mm -hmm. And I think I almost did something like that to someone today. So just because you're someone who intersectionally is, you know, marginal in some ways does not mean that you might not hurt someone in, this, in that way in an, or oppress them or something like that. Self-reflexivity is a very important part of this work. Um, so Kim says, academic responsi responsibility seems to be a convenience, says Jasmine. Um, so in terms like inclusivity, we all need to be on the same page, avoid reactive inclusivity. Um, <clears throat> that idea of inclusion is something that always has to be taken a hard look at. You know, what is it that we're all striving to to be a part of? And, and, you know, and why are we assuming we want to be that that we should all be on the same page? So uh, Kate Denial says. Uh, that she joined a fantastic international launch. And we like this slide simply because it, it just showed all of the faces, uh, not all of the faces, but some, a select, a small selection of the faces that um, have joined us. And there's been so much profound learning. Um, so these things are archived by the way, these conversations, and there'll be plenty more moving forward. I just realized I'm, I'm like this in that picture, which is okay. The, this, it's like a lean back and enjoy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is very much 
much the experience. <laughs> if you need to stretch, go ahead and do that. We're halfway through the keynote. Back like we're almost, we're, we're getting close to it. Yeah. Maha Alfrey says, I had to rearrange my schedule today to be able to attend this event. And I'm glad I did. Such a wonderful international group coming together for a great cause. These are recorded There's, so you can watch them later. Yes, and there's so much work um, still ahead of us. We're just getting started. Miriam Hacker said, just finished this workshop. And one concept that struck with me is the way that colonial debris remains in theoretical frameworks. This comes from Jose Crossa. Um, there is a need to reimagine how we analyze and understand experience in academia. So thankful. So um, that idea of colonial debris, the things that are sort of like left behind and lodged in the way we go about what we do when we are producing knowledge um, that still continues to sustain uh, in some way profound injustice and inequity. These are the things that we're thinking about when we talk about colonial debris. Um, and this was a useful um, model for thinking about it. Okay, so the or second one was the curriculum, right? People want to hear about the curriculum. And so that's the origin story. Um, this is actually the uh, Mia, Catherine, and I together in the UK at Coventry, I think it was, that we yes, took this picture. Coventry University, yes. Yeah. And we were doing a workshop together with Alan Levine for about, I think, intercultural something about microaggression. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, you went and muted. Oh, now oh. you're okay. Okay. Keep going. Um, and our motto is the, the only way to make borders meaningless is to keep insisting on crossing them. It says my internet connection is unstable, so let me know if you can't hear me. Lina Munzer, this article by Lina Munzer, I'm going to put the link in the chat because it's such a good article. It's called War in Translation, and she's a Lebanese translator who translates the stories of um, Syrian women into, uh, from Arabic into English. And her work is some of the work that we work with in our in our curriculum and also uh, she inspires us with that quote especially the foundation of a lot of what we do so equity unbound um, Mia and I teach courses and Catherine at the time she doesn't anymore teach courses where we can integrate some kind of intercultural learning and we do intercultural learning without an equity focus it can have a lot of power differentials in it and it can be really inequitable and problematic and so we wanted to create a curriculum that would focus that but also build on the open and connected learning that we know works for us and start um, giving opportunities for students to do them as well. So we select articles and videos uh, and then people can contribute their own, whether other open participants who are uh, you know, educators or students. We use annotation, usually using the tool hypothesis. Sometimes we do it open and public and sometimes we do a group for our students to work on together. And a lot of other educators join in, even if they're not part of the entire curriculum, sometimes they'll join into that. We do studio visits, which are informal uh, conversations with experts in an area. Uh, they come in, they talk to our students, and, and again, anyone else in the world can join. It's not just our students, uh, even though it's designed for our students. This is our uh, Twitter hashtag, and sometimes we have uh, activities on Twitter, slow chats, um, that kind of thing. We were originally doing aggregated blog posts, but right now we aggregate our own students' blog posts, and we don't do that on the site anymore, but we were originally doing that. And then sort of a crowdsourced knowledge bank, like anyone can contribute to it. Now that aspect we need to, is now in, I think a poverty trap or something. We need to work on improving that so that it's easier for people to contribute than, than originally we planned. But the things, I saw people talking about Canon and things like that in the chat. And it's part of like what we think about is when we choose authors and speakers and guests, we're very careful about whom we choose. I mean, we choose mainly people of color, uh, people from the global south, lots of women. And the thing is, when you choose those people, are you always choosing the famous ones? Or are you able to reach people that are maybe lesser known as well, who actually offer a different perspective? Because just because of someone's identity, that's important. But it's also important, what do they have to offer? And what do they give to students? And for me, being from my part of the world, but working in an American university, it's really important for my students to see African scholars, to see Arab scholars, to see that knowledge comes from different parts of the world. And it's not just coming down to them, but it's coming from them as well. Um, and, and the other thing is that the, the activities that we do are almost all open, connected. There are some levels, of course, of private and closed and you know, within our own classrooms happening all the time. But the equity unbound part of it is, is in that open side of it. 
Um, and it's open for participation and contribution. So any, anyone can use what's there, it's open, it's on the web. Anyone can contribute to it. We say this, but we know, of course, that if you don't know me and me, or you don't know Catherine, you don't know some of the other people who are with us, um, who you saw in the pictures, they may not do that. So we're always trying to sort of try and encourage that, but we know mm -hmm. that this is easier said than done. Uh, and in practice, it's a lot more complex than that. For me, like for my students, I give them an assignment to contribute something to the curriculum, because if so, a few of them will do it, they'll have the confidence, but most of them won't do it on their own unless prompted, right? Um, Mia, I think I want you to do this part. Yes, um, so we, this was on the heels of um, asking questions about equity and bound and what it means to people. And one of our partners, Persa Memran, um, said, um, do I feel 100% belonging to this project? No, and that's because of who I am and in which era I live. I'm an Iranian woman living in the age of Trumpism. Um, this makes my presence too political. So when I join the events held by Unbound Ec or Equity Unbound, I stick to the groups led by its founders. But she says this, Equity Unbound is where I don't feel like a minority within a minority. Um, in particular, I, I'm proud of the facts that she says that folks are not there to get promoted by using equity and social justice. The research budget, budget doesn't control the choices made in how the project is evolving and unfolds. Um, and apparently this project actually wants to make a difference. To me, this is, this is the most meaningful thing that the directive comes from the care that's born of our hearts. Um, next slide. I also love that she says, I don't know if you said this, mm -hmm. I was reading the chat. Research budget doesn't control this project. Yes, I really did. <laughs> you did say it. Okay. I'm just yes. No, but it's something. <laughs> it's something that we that is the case. Is that you know sometimes you have to follow the trail of money to know where the inflection really lies. Yeah. But we're really we're really fortunate and privileged. I think that we never we are. needed to do that. Yes, we are. But um, next slide, Maha, because I think there's a follow up point that I think is really important here. I moved it. It just takes a while to get to. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Pause. It's a whole um, like, look how many yeah. miles. <laughs> It's good, it gives us a pause. But um, Parisa also responds to the question of what do you get from it? And this is um, what I love the most. She says, I'm not looking for a sense of belonging anymore. I just want it to be a place where I can bring all my complexities, criticisms, radicalness, hopes, dreams, without being silenced, to be able to improve my teaching by learning from like-minded educators. I responded by saying, this is everything. Um, but I also furthered that idea by saying, the notion of an all-encompassing or comfortable sense of belonging is seductive and problematic. It's a mirage. Um, I think we fall into this trap sometimes when we get in, um, too enthusiastic about looking for that um, like soft place of belonging because it's so closely related to tradition and who's in and who's out and who deserve to become a part of this. And I, do, I think that what I like to sort of, we like to um, move towards is the care because care is real and it makes transformative difference in how we can live together and it, and, and it moves through different um, connectivity without being a kind of all encompassing blanket of in or outness. Asukane Walji uh, also says, thank you so much for sharing and nurturing it. It was a joy to listen to all of your stories. It's good to be reminded it's okay to feel as well as to think and read about issues around equity. And here, here there's something I think we didn't put in the slides, but is the case that when we started Equity Unbound, it was more something we, we thought we were doing it for our students. And then we realized halfway through that it ended up being something we did for ourselves, because the work of social justice is such hard work and such effective labor because systems are so unjust that it became a supportive community for educators. And so that's where the continuity with care came originally to, to help educators who wanted to care find support with other educators who are like-minded outside their institutions so that you can get that energy back into your own institutions mm -hmm. and learn from each other. But that equity and bound became what made me a better teacher in my classroom, even in the parts where Mia and Catherine were not there and no one else was there. Mm -hmm. All right, we're doing very well on time. Yay. <laughs> Yay. So the community building resources, which we launched in August uh, this year, but this is urgency that people who had never taught online, which maybe a lot of people here had taught online before, but those who didn't, didn't know how to build community. So we started making these resources 
uh, available here, which I know Regina sent earlier. Uh, and you can take a look at each one of them. And there are different kinds. There are introductory activities to use at the beginning of a the semester. There are warm-up activities to use at the beginning of a class or maybe to cool down at the end of a class. Those of you who came to the Mad Wild Tea yesterday, that was one of the warm-up activities. And if you come to the spiral journal towards the end of the conference in one of the tea times, that's a good cool down or warm up activity. And there are also these liberating structures. If you've never heard of the liberating structures, I'm sure some of you have. These are great structures to ensure equitable conversations. They work really well online with breakout rooms and they help you help people have a good conversation in breakout rooms, even though when you're not there as a facilitator. Um, and so we have ideas also for setting the tone that are not, I mean, a lot of these are video demonstrations of something with adaptations of how you might do it if your students don't have their camera on, if you have to be asynchronous, that kind of thing. If you don't have breakout rooms, how would you do it? Uh, but they have videos of people doing them so that it's a little bit easier for you to learn how to do this on your own. But the setting the tone ones aren't necessarily videos. Um, as Kate Bowles contributed the safety considerations to keep in mind when you introduce an introductory activity that might mm -hmm. harm certain people who are particularly vulnerable. And there are notes that Autumn Keynes and I wrote about video conferencing and how you would go about setting the tone there. Um, and May Saimed contributed a trauma-informed pedagogy. How do you ask students how they're feeling today? Um, and so the thing about this one is I think the urgency of it, people saying we were just discussing this today, you know, and, and so the timing was so important. You know, when you look at that eco cycle thing, we had yeah. to move from the idea to the birth in something like two or three weeks. Yeah, real and time we did it. reactions, yes. And we did, it. and you realize that you can do things like that. Yep. If you're and given the resources to do it. So true. And, um, and you, and you're also um, in a community that that is there for you and supports you in moving. Definitely, it because these are contributed yeah. by a lot of people. Yes. And a lot of people, when they saw them, started contributing more to them. Um, but the idea actually came out of a virtually connecting session that Autumn and I were in. Mm -hmm. um, and people like uh, Patrice and Irene mm -hmm. were in that session. And and from there, that's where we continued the conversation. Mia, do you want to keep? Yeah, Alan, Alan Levine says um, that it's a great collection, but he, he makes a very important point that it's not all tied to tools and platforms. It's not the tools, it's the pedagogy, it's the community building, it's the relationships. That's what's at the heart of designing this. And this is Henrietta Carbonell saying the same thing we were saying earlier is there's a lot of people were losing that social contact part and this is how to build community. Um, and Kim Fox, Kim, you've been quoted a lot today. She's saying <laughs> she'd been watching videos all week, uh, getting yeah. ideas. Um, if any of you have used some of these and you think some of them are good, that would be great if you just mentioned in the chat which ones so that other people could try them as well. Mia, I'll let you go to the next uh, slide. Okay. Oh, I, I guess it's uh, Kay, Kay Saibottom says, fantastic ideas for online community building here. In the rush to create digital content, don't over-focus on curriculum and forget the importance of establishing relationships. I guess I made that point just a minute earlier, but it really is an important one that, um, that learning, the, the spark of learning happens in the connections that you make with students and your co-learners, et cetera. So this is the emphasis in the collection itself. Um, and Janae uh, Cohn, we just love this tweet because it's a wowza. <laughs> this collection of community building online class activities is a very veritable treasure trove. Um, so many wonderful ideas for sync and async activities that promote community equity and engagement. Uh, we want to tell you something. We are showing, obviously we're, sh we're showing off a little bit, but we're also trying to point out the particular things that people found important about them. And also to let you know, like when we asked people, what does equity and mean to you? We didn't get a lot of responses. So these are actually unsolicited tweets that were just people were sending when they found the resources rather than ones that we asked for feedback on. The sync uh, and async was important there. That, that, that yeah, those yeah. Were. Uh, and for this one, I think I want to emphasize the aesthetically pleasing yet practical, so making it easy for people to find stuff and how it's organized. And Jim Stoffer, you're getting quoted a lot too, but we really like this cookies on a lower shelf. It's like yeah. you could have heard of liberating structures, but seeing someone do it makes it a lot easier to imagine how you could do it in your own class. You can grab at the sweet stuff easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think I also like that Thomas Tobin um, notice the equitable aspect 
of the resources. So yes, they're about community building, but we're also trying to make it an equitable form of community building. Just because you're building community doesn't mean that everyone is gonna feel welcome. Um, and then James Lang, who's never been a fan of icebreakers. And we had this conversation in our continuity with care. I'll mention yeah. what this is in a second. That a lot of people don't like icebreakers, but yeah. he found one that he liked. And that's why we don't call them icebreakers. We call them warming up. <laughs> We were trying to figure out why it's even called an icebreaker, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we actually have time to do the last one. Yeah, so that's great. We've been through all of them. So the continuity with care, which uh, started with a crowdsourcing, we just did this bit.ly slash online with care, which now I think this Google Doc is so full that it's harder to get into now. Um, but people were just crowdsourcing. What are people doing about this continuity with care thing? What can they share with their institutions and stuff? I think this one with Daniel, um, we put in here because it was the date was March 10th. And the whole emphasis was, if you need something right now, here's something that's just coming out. And it, it de again, emphasizes that eco cycle responsivity the, um, that we've been talking about. Then the actual call that we had was on March 13th. And um, this is Sherry Spielitz. Uh, we, we also like the monkeys. <laughs> yeah. um, talking about how it felt like being with friends on that day. I remember that conversation, Mia, that day, every minute someone would say, oh my God, my institution just said they're going to close tomorrow. Oh my God, yeah. my institution just said they're going to close. And I remember people getting calls and leaving. I remember Robin DeRosa leaving in the middle of the call, Barney Stewart leaving in the middle yep. of the call, because everyone was hearing that news all over the world, mm -hmm. like ripple effects. We were... The global ri ripple effect. Yeah, was Australia. To, yeah, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. Um. And this is a quote from Sana Khabar, who's a Moroccan living in Ireland, about how it felt because you would feel isolated if you didn't have the opportunity to be with people here. If you're the only one who's caring that deeply about your students and not finding a lot of support where you are. Um, and talking about how, you know, this was a time to model our values and not just focus on learning out. I'm sure a lot of you had that same thing. But the real continuity with care is invisible. There's a Twitter DM that I started to invite people to the conversation that we're going to have. Initially, it was just to invite people to the conversation because I didn't have time to send them email. <laughs> and it's been an ongoing DM ever since then, up until day. It's been my lifeline. It's been a place where I brainstorm with people. It's been a place where I'm anxious and I go to people. There's a lot of people there. If you can't go um, to the coffee shop to meet with your friends, there's the DM, <laughs> yeah. right? It's really yeah. kept, kept us, our hearts full and supported. Okay. We are actually about five minutes out now, five minutes and we'll be done. And then we can take questions if people have things to say in the Q&A. Thank you so much for keeping the chat active. That's how I know people are enjoying. Yeah. So I, with the DM, it's a, I would say it's kind of a private space between friends. If it gets to be too many people, it won't be a lot of fun. But we will have a socially just academia private space that's maybe a Slack mm -hmm. team, maybe a mailing list. Uh, and yeah. that one uh, you'll be able to join, inshallah. Mm -hmm. That will be open. Excellent. It'll have maybe channels and things like that. So I, I'm kind of now, I'm, I'm realizing what I just did there. I just told you about the exclusive aspect, <laughs> which is the, the DM, but uh, yeah. Well, also it's right. mindful just to, just to be, it's mindful also of the way community um, grows and it's a, a management um, concern that I think is, is a thoughtful one. And there are other spaces where we can start new ones as well and, and have threads within. And I think that's powerful and important. Yeah. All right, so we're asking you to tell us in the chat, what's one key takeaway uh, that you have? Oh, thanks, Beth. Oh, I didn't realize I said inshallah. I mean, I say it all the time. <laughs> like, and all my close friends say it, like whatever their religion, even when they're atheists, they say it. Mm -hmm. uh, consider care, whatever I consider, whenever I consider equity, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, they really like the care without equity, equity without care. I'm so happy to hear that because we worked yeah. so much on that slide, I think. That's when, when we were we... really popping. <laughs> mm -hmm. We got really excited yeah. and, and the energy yeah. like was really coming from, from yeah. thinking about that deeply. Views are always partial. Let's take a minute and inspired. Sign seductiveness mm -hmm. of belonging. That's, that's mm -hmm. an interesting road to start Ooh, to think nice. about. Yeah. giving birth and destroying mm -hmm. difference between care and supportive spaces reactive the the value in reactive um, being mm -hmm. responsive yeah 
Someone said something about, um, you know, check yourself when you ask students to focus on academic sources, need to be more inclusive. And one of the things is sometimes that they won't be peer reviewed articles if you want diversity. That's one of the key things that um, I always say, it's just, it's, it's not, not credible just because it's not in peer reviewed, right? Bonnie Jean, you're totally um, uh, invited to join us in this work. And I hope we'll be in touch because she said that she wanted okay. to join, yes. be a part of this. Oh, yeah bring her actually we identity should to the work. should we should we put a link to the i think it's still open um so regina had put the link for uh, socially just academia if you go to the original event i think you can still register the event is over but you can still register and then you'll we'll send you an email to join us i think that might be the best way and you can of course follow the twitter accounts as well and stay mm -hmm. in touch mm -hmm. um we should maybe I don't know, put these resources up later, the links. Yeah, we can put them up as soon as we wrap up. We just have some yeah. a, a last. We can add words. it to the end of the slides. Yeah. So yeah. from the link that Regina just sent, look for the event itself and sign up for it, even though it's over. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. still open. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I really like I like tennis, by the way, very much. So do I. It's and a thing in the family for me too. So I didn't realize that you like tennis. Yeah, I, I know. I never said that. <laughs> I'm not as good as my sisters, but I still like it. And my, well, I can't play, but I like watching players. My sons are tennis players. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I love this quote from Arthur Ashe, you know, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. It sounds simple, but it, a lot of people get stuck, right? Get yep. stuck in the poverty trap because yep. you're trying to get more resources than you need to get something started because you want the whole thing. But mm -hmm. like with the community building resources, we launched with six. Mm -hmm. And the six made a difference at the time because it was mid-August and people were about to start. And then we added to them. And now they're 30 plus, they're maybe 40 now. Um, so our takeaways. So our takeaways. <laughs> start with your values. Center social justice and care and do it at all the levels within your control and influence and listen for critiques, right? And reflect and iterate. You're never there or done. And someone wrote something similar to that before. Really embrace this emergence. You know, emergence is not being able to see everything. You can't see where you're going completely. Embrace that. Be responsive to your community. And Mia and Maha, mm -hmm. we have a question actually at um, in their Q and A from Leticia, mm -hmm. and she asked, "Thank you so much for your amazing lecture. One question: Have you worked more directly with medical students?" No. Nope. I don't have medical students in my institution. My husband yeah. is a doctor. Does that help? And Mia's dad is a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and my we parents are doctors. doctors. In the family. We have doctors we in the family. My husband doesn't let me work with him. Like he says, why, why isn't everyone listening to you in the This is a good question Africa? though, because I think th this is a, such an important question because in many ways, um, when we're talking about care, we're thinking about healing, healing, not right. uh, healing on scale, like at scale is what we're thinking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't really like the inference of the question is an important one. And yeah. I can tell you something. I, I work with people who do liberating structures and I've given workshops with them. And in the UK, the NHS, the National Health Service, get free liberating structures um, workshops so that they can use them in their own field. And things like eco-cycle planning and some of the liberating structures are used a lot in the medical field, not with students, with actual um, people who were in the healthcare field mm -hmm. to make sure that they're listening both to the patients and to each other uh, and able mm -hmm. to have uh, productive conversations, but mm -hmm. not, not us directly working with them Yeah, in the way that care is a very different meaning, right? It's a much more complex thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even things, notions like equity are, are much more complex in the medical field, yeah. I think. Have you, you, you were still talking about emergence though, right? Yeah, I was just um, emphasizing some of the aspects of what it means to um, embrace emergence. It's, it's, it's um, first of all, you have to have a tolerance for, for not being able to see everything at first, um, but also you have to be responsive to your community. You um, need openness um, and uh, that allows for agility in the ways um, in ways that are maybe less doable within your institutional context, but you know, it, it's something, it's, it's a way of navigating through um, the, the kind of landmines of this time and, and um, the challenges that we're facing in society, et cetera. Finally, um, uh, find and grow your community, your allies, 
um, and the intersecting affinity spaces um, that you can perceive in, in your network. Yeah. That's important that those affinity spaces allow for you know, different levels of um, engagement, right? We don't have to ask everyone to be fully engaged when, when it makes sense for them that they can come in and out. And this one, I was just at the display posium on Friday. Mm -hmm. And this, I realized it's also important to find time for playfulness and making and finding joy in learning spaces. And we all need it for our own mental health and well being because there isn't a systemic way to do this yet. So mm -hmm. find, find people who will bring you joy and be with mm -hmm. them and find things that will bring you joy, we hope. Something that sounds simple, but is so central and not in some ways easy. So remember that, <laughs> the playfulness and the creativity yeah. and your well-being. Thank and you I all so much. I really love Thank you. Thank you, you so said. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what you said, you Maha, about, about, you know, finding pockets of joy. I mean, that is what sustains mm -hmm. me, you know, mm -hmm. find those pockets of joy, whether for me, it's like having dark chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's for and, me the way too regina <laughs> I, and I cook cooking so i cook a lot yeah. chocolate <laughs> but yeah. you're what do other people do tell us in the chat what do you do to find yeah. those pockets of joy pockets of joy definitely baking with my daughter does that to me yes. and dancing for me it's um walking deep walking. breaths in the walking and then noticing just this simple beauty of nature all around me mm. that one's really powerful for me yeah, yeah. i'm seeing a lot of walking and walking. car karaoke <laughs> prayer yeah prayer for me yes. as well meditation, meditation. Yeah. prayer play and, piano and centering watch oneself. movies watch movie. oh yeah binge watching is also healing sometimes I mean, sometimes, sometimes watching a, a movie that you'll admit readily is, is stupid and silly but silly. still somewhere yeah. It, yeah. It's so it's important not, your yeah. mind needs a break yeah. <laughs> hey, what did you guys think of that? Your mind, take a break. Give your mind a break picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, what reading. What were we saying too, today, Mia? What, what's that? Yeah. Uh -huh. What, what was the thing we said together on a WhatsApp today? We need a world. Oh, world recharge day. <laughs> we need a world recharge day. <laughs> I have this um, like GIF file for my students when we take like a break in class and it looks like a battery that's charging with the, you know, like the bars going up, but it's a chocolate bar with the chocolate appearing. <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> and, I, and then I say recharge. <laughs> And also, if you want to continue the conversation beyond this session, we have um, immediately following at 1130 um, or so. After a five <laughs> uh, minute break, take you can take a bathroom yes, break. We'll take a, a, few, you know, a few minutes break and we'll meet you at tea time. Mm -hmm. I think 1130, 35-ish. So. And we're also, we've also got virtually connecting tonight with Terry Green. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah, also, if you I, can't make it immediately, yeah, right. you can come to the later one. We have it's at one thirty, right? One thirty mm -hmm. Eastern. The one thirty, yes. Yeah, I Andrew what, Murphy. Yeah. I just wanted to say I love what Jess said. In the it just caught my eye. I mean, there's so many good things, but I just read the birds and cat cage picture reminded me of Paulo Freire. Um, to be careful not to become the oppressor in our yes. efforts to emancipate. I think yes. that's a beautiful one. That image that's a great just. One we needed to put it there even though it wasn't like in the flow of the conceptual things we were sort of loading up but we wanted it there because it was meaningful and thank you Jess for articulating some things yes, around you. that yeah and there's really a lot of good things that were um, put on the chat by you know our um, our attendees it's like I want to read them so, so when many. we save this yeah yeah I'm saving, the chat saves automatically for me and I'm a panelist. So uh, Regina, are you gonna share the chat with folks? Can um, you, do you have a way to share it? Nicole, do we have a way to share it? Can we embed it in Sketch? We do have a way to share it. Uh, we wanna consider that, that, that maybe people, Some this people was a- to. Yeah. Do you have the people who registered and only share it with people who registered? Can you do that? We, we can absolutely do that. Yeah, that might be safer. I think you're right. Like with chat, it's not necessarily meant to be shared publicly, but so people who registered for this event, I think makes sense. So... 
Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. It's such a pleasure. And, you know, one of the things that's tough is that we're, you know, it's wonderful that we can connect with so many through the screen, but then I, I wish I could see people, see people's faces, hug people. It, this is always hard, the hard part. Yeah. Well, at least we'll see their faces in the tea time and the be connecting. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't like Zoom webinar for that aspect where you can't see people at all. Yeah. Even though I don't ask my students to turn their cameras on, when I'm at conferences, I do want to see people's face, which is very funny because I'm not obsessed with the camera thing, but. Yeah, yeah. there's something about seeing their faces, even like the screen and like, oh, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's really a lot of tweets about your session so thank yeah, you I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them when yeah. i finally have a break <laughs> yeah, probably yes. tomorrow morning <laughs> after, the tomorrow morning. after the yeah, recharge after the recharge i need to go check on my child is it but nobody has questions which is great i guess we've said yeah. everything <laughs> nobody has this but tends we'll to happen in, in my keynotes time. people interact a lot yeah that's true maybe they'll ask the hard questions for tea time yeah <laughs> it'll be harder you know, it's never hard. It's just uh, like, <laughs> just, <laughs> just thinking. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Especially for you, it's never hard. It's always like, mm, why wow. say especially Thank for you me? Opening that up. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people Not to process. Were inspired. A lot, a lot of people fired, invigorated by. Yay. That's great. There were that, that I would choose. Yes. The sort of outcome um, beyond the conceptual stuff, then those would be the words. So yeah. that makes me really happy to hear. So someone is asking uh, um, if you go to the Equity Unbound website and you take a look, it's really difficult to navigate it, but <laughs> we need to work on that. Um, but which one, where would, you, where would you start, Mia? With just the general? Well, yeah, I mean, basically, you see that there's the curriculum, and then there's all kinds of events. You see the, what that's where you see the activities, the events, the resources. Then you can also um, see the socially imagining socially just academia, and you can also see. Which the... doesn't have readings, though. The readings are in the curriculum itself. Yeah. I mean, because I don't like to give um, canon. I would say Bell Hooks is maybe the most person that I like reading, uh, who embodies, I think it's really important, this embodiment aspect of equity. Was that like the when question read, is what to read? I didn't hear that. Readings of where to start. Oh, mm. I thought it was so about I'm not the sure website. what they want to okay. start. I don't know yeah. what they want to start, but that's what came to my mind is Bell Hooks. Yeah, Bell Hooks is a... Yeah. Is a Maybe is others a, in the chat can have their recommendations, like what's the first thing you would send someone to read if they're interested in something like what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. because yeah. sometimes like the journey is really winding uh, but I'd say because what I like about Bell Hooks is that it's about how do I embody this in my practice rather than and Spivak oh yeah definitely mm -hmm. thank you for that that's for decolonizing yeah. oh John is asking the, the books in my bookcase oh there's so many um, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like one of those things where there's the uh, accumulation of books that come from your grad school years and then you're just like um, pleasure reading and then my husband's books versus my books <laughs> you know like all of this but okay I'm just reading I'm just turning around and seeing uh you know, there's something on Glenn Gould here. I mean, I, I could just go on and on. Um, Richard Wright is right in front of me. Um, Middle March, uh, just uh, uh, Coetzee, Slowman, you know, whatever. I'm just, just reading <laughs> Brothers Karamazov. There's a whole Nabokov section, you know. Well, okay, so, uh, but <laughs> that, that, that was my like informal response to that question. <laughs> But you know, when it comes to the work, uh, the social justice work, um, and the the question that Maha was responding to earlier, I think that's an important um, uh, list to generate. And I would also put Bell Hooks right at the top. Paula Frere, who was mentioned. Yeah. Um, you know. And hybrid pedagogy, I would say, as a journal as a whole, with short articles, that's a good place to go as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an open access journal with short articles. Mm -hmm. Are there other spaces that we look at a lot? Core by Sherry Spellick. This is, these mm -hmm. are examples mm. of things that- Or her blog. Mm -hmm. um, or her blog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul Prince Lou. 
Mm -hmm. Paul Prince Lou. Paul Prince Lou, for sure. Laura Chernovich was on this Laura. call. Yeah, yeah Laura is Laura. on the call. Catherine Cronin was mm -hmm. our collaborator. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I posted the link for that Zoom thing. Okay. It should still work. I'm going to check that it works. I don't think I closed it. Oh, it doesn't work anymore. So, okay, I'll figure, I'll figure this out. Yeah. I'll figure out a way for people to be able to sign up. I'm sorry that it doesn't work anymore. Kate Bowles and Francis Bell for sure. Thank you, Tanya. There are too many people. If we started, it's one of those things that, you know, when the Twitter list, like name, I don't know, 20 women or something. Yeah. <laughs> You'll always forget someone who's really, oh, yes. really good. Then there, there's always addendum after addendum on those tweets, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and that's a wonderful thing because yeah. that just means it's... Yeah. So many more. So are you going like to follow up with the um, socially just academia? Yes, gathering? I will create a new form. I'll just create a new form or something. Okay. Yeah, because um, it seems a lot I of I will people post it everywhere. Okay. I, I'll, I'm sharing my screen, aren't I? I have to stop sharing. Yeah, share screen. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I'm about to show you my email. But no, it was on a different um, window, so it's okay. But um, <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'll create a form and then we can send it to all open ed attendees if you want, or put it on the SCED or put it on Discord, put it on Twitter, we'll put it everywhere. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And if you can't find it, tweet us and we'll find you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that the community, we, we need to now move on with this, creating that space so that people can. Join yeah, uh, there's the. We'll, okay, the next there's step. a social justice <laughs> channel. Great. Okay, yes, that's a good place. Thanks, Jeff. Excellent. So we have 10 minutes till tea time. You want to take a little break? And yeah. Yes. Maybe, maybe, I, I think maybe I'm going to make can. some tea <laughs> for yeah. tea time. Quick, quick.